This week's episode of Modern Art Family Tree is brought to you by the Foster Gallery. The Foster Gallery is a gallery in Worcester, Massachusetts, who specializes in paintings, drawings, and prints. Find them at www.thefostergallery.com. Hi everybody, this is Matthew Foster and this is episode four of the Modern Art Family Tree. I'm joined again by Dennis Hart. Dennis, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Not bad. Um, and here we are again, doing doing the thing now. This is becoming like normal for us, right? That's so right. Uh, um, today we are uh, going to go full circle in the, you know, what we teased last week, which was bringing up uh, Dumier. Um, and I think that he is a, a fitting addition to this uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and he's actually a stark contrast to Corot as far as lifestyle and career and everything. Um, I, I would almost say that I think that they're almost as opposite as you can get um, between just how they live their lives. Um, so he's a fascinating character. He's definitely, I mean, I know for me personally, he's a big influence um, and uh, and definitely part of the scene uh, that leads into Impressionism. Um, but that's who we're going to talk about. So I hope you're ready, pal. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> okay, cool. So, uh, so Dumier was, again, of the same time as the other three guys that we've mentioned so far, which was Corot, Corbet, and Mier. And... Um, he was uh, very different from Corot, like I said before, he was uh, not well off. And uh, I think the biggest um, attribute, if you will, uh, of his personality difference and, and the way he worked and stuff was he really did a lot more uh, printmaking and he was also a sculptor. He was kind of like a well-rounded artist, but he did a lot of that stuff out of necessity, not because he just had a desire to do it. He was an early adopter of lithographs, right? Yep. And and he was a, a printmaker, but really because he was able to sell them. Um, I think that he enjoyed painting, but I, I think that he really did lith or, um, printmaking because it was something that could get into journals and things like that. Right. And, uh, and also, and this is where I think he's starkly different from everybody we've talked about so far outside of maybe Corbet, is that he's deeply political. Which, which the other guys, I mean, you can make claims that they have maybe political interests or undertones, but I mean, I mean, Dumier is blatantly political, right, right, um, from his earliest stages. So I think that we'll see that and how that shapes what he makes and why he's important as as a part of his story. Um, so let's talk a little bit about about him stylistically because he's definitely different from the other guys we've talked about. Um, and you may have a difference of opinion with me on this, Dennis, and, and feel free to, to offer up something different, you know, but I really see like a, um, there's an obvious Rubens, um, like interest in his figures and how he, and granted he's a caricature artist. So, so mm -hmm. that's, that's one aspect that I guess we need to put out right on the table right away is that he was a person who caricaturized, um, uh, figures and people and political people and, and uh, social uh, classes. And so there was some nature of, of extenuating, you know, body parts and things like that um, as a caricaturist would. But I would still say that his mark making and his anatomy interest and stuff kind of come from a Rubens type of background, uh, an interest in, in that area and for people listening to this that are not art you know historians um rubens was a painter that was was, was he flemish is that right oh uh, yeah peter paul rubens yeah yeah and he was a a huge influence on painters um for years and years and years past his time and um he was uh well known as, as being you know having these fully developed figures that were in these uh very dramatic poses and 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 you know uh, uh, the northern uh, what would you call him uh, as far as a school uh time frame um because he's not really renaissance he's not northern renaissance he's after that right he's, he's later um 
You know, that's a that's a good question. I'm not. Uh... His while you're looking at that, his his style became so well known that people started saying Rubenesque. You know. Yeah. And yeah. and, and when you have figures like a... are so you know he has a lot of voluptuous figures and they're exactly. very exaggerated and I mean there there there's a soft touch to his to his treatment but it's uh and it's they're not like uh caricatures in any way like like Tom Yates might be considered but but there's certainly some uh you know there's a lot of expression to them there's a lot of uh I don't know yeah well, <laughs> it's just it's they're they're soft and 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 real I mean they're certainly very real but they're fully figured. They're they're definitely. Yeah. He was definitely a fan of, uh, and and that was part of his time frame was the fully figured female and things like that was was a was a look and a style, um, and and in favor at the time. And uh, but I, I guess what I'm referencing is his mark making style. His which which was very you know a lot of rounded like. Um, uh, like you were saying, soft edges and, and rounded figures and things like that. I see a lot of that come through for Dumier, uh, especially when you get to the paintings and stuff. But I also see a lot of the Dutch influence again, and I know we've said this about many of the guys we've talked about already, but there's a lot of Dutch influence in the colors and the, and the way that the light is perceived and things like that. I guess I uh, to, to just go to step back a minute and, and, yep. and I'm finding that uh, they they classify Rubens as a Flemish Baroque painter, which oh, I think yeah. is actually a good. Yeah, I can see that as being a good mix for him. I mean that that's uh, and there's probably some you know art teacher out there right now going, really guys, you didn't know that, but but you know that, that would make, I, well you know hey, I we, mean, don't, we I, don't claim to be experts on yeah, this. We're, yeah, just, exactly. we're just sharing our thoughts. We're we're painters, not historians, right? Right. But uh, but no, I, that makes sense now that you say it. As as being uh, uh, Baroque would fit, um, especially as colors and things like that. Well, we're talking, you know, sixteen hundred. You know, a little before, a little after. So so so, so several it, generations before Dumier. I mean, right, right, without many, any yeah, problem. yeah, a few hundred so, years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. So um, so just a little bit about Dumier here. He he was like I said, uh, not well off. Um, he uh, started doing um, printmaking for um, publications. Yeah, a lot of them were humor, were humor, you know, comedic journals as well, which which explains some of his, you know, some of what he did as well. Well, why don't you dive into that just a little bit before we start looking at the work? Is is this is a time frame before like the Yellow Kid and and, and Yellow Journal or uh, not Yellow Journalism, but uh, cartoons and things like that are really the norm yet, right? Um, right, right, right. He's uh, one of the first sort of political, uh, you know, artists. I guess you could say. Really, that wasn't something that was. Uh, touched in, in this way up until then. I mean, I'm, I know there were always sort of illustrators, right? They didn't have photographers for their publications. Uh, uh, they maybe were beginning to, but up, up until now, the, that type of that type of magazine or anything was always uh, decorated with lithography or or some kind of printing, right? Yeah. So illustrations were a big deal. Um, and the reason I bring up the comedy part of it is because that's 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 probably where the strong the strong caricature uh, comes from. I mean, that's, that's what he was. That's what he was probably. That was probably his bread and butter for a long time. Was it, was it doing that sort was. of thing and, and getting paid to do so. Yep. No, I I would definitely believe that. Is it? I mean, and even now when when we talk about him, as you're saying, people consider him a satirist. I mean that. He, he definitely um, influenced satire as far as how it was being used in publication. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say that. Well, with that, should we go ahead and bring up, let's bring up the first uh, image. And um, so this is not a painting, obviously. This is a, a print, right? And uh, the first one we'll start with is the... Um, is the, the blue is washing out and the red stains like blood. Uh, the launderers, right? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I mean, it doesn't get much more political than that, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. right. And, Especially uh, these times, you know, you have to think about uh, 
the unrest and whatnot going on during the industrial era in, in uh, Paris. You know, there's a, there's a lot of... This was where the working class really started to become... They, they, became, they started to have a voice, you know, and yep. I think this is, this is going to be evident in a lot of his work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. You know, and and he was truly politically minded. From from what I understand, is that he he was involved with these things um, to the degree that you know he was part of the censorship from the state. Uh, that he got to the point where he was censored and jailed for six months um, <laughs> for a for a satire that he made of the king. And uh, and then um, political cartoons about the king became like illegal I mean it was, it was considered a red mark and then uh, after that he switched to doing satire about social satire because it was less uh, less potent less you know wouldn't get him in as much trouble <laughs> but uh, but this was before that this was definitely political and uh, he had a whole series of um, of work about the justice system and the lawyers and things like that and what I find interesting about this is even though it's not totally tied to that you still have a justice in here the guy scrubbing is a is a uh, uh, a judge if you will uh, or you know or a barrister lawyer type um, and that uniform that he's wearing the guy bending down at the wash barrel there uh, was in many 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 of his you know this was a character among his um, illustrations um, and then, of course, he brings in, you know, these other two characters that are obviously uh, military slash bureaucrat type guys, you know. Um, but all of these were quick, in quick succession development type works. They're not pieces that, uh, that he worked on for years. He, he would work on them quickly, get them produced, and then move on to the next one. Um, and then, you know, because of that, he had thousands of them. I mean, that, that's uh, what I've always seen is that he did these in quick succession and was actually wishing to move on to other things and never wanted to make, you know, the, the, the old quote was he always wished the one he was working on was his last, you know. Um, but he did, he was great at them, and there's many, many, many of them to see. Now, I got a, I got a question for you, <laughs> and, I, and just talk to this for me. When I see these, not not stylistically, but just because they're famous and because they're prints, I think of like the old Goya prints and stuff. Yeah, there's definitely some some. Uh, when well, well, this will come up again, I know I know for sure, but there's definitely some. Uh, I don't want to call it reference to Goya in his work, but there, but there's certainly he certainly was very familiar with and. Uh, um, probably influenced by Goya. By Goya, yeah. By the by the, and I'm trying to remember the name of the series was what Tragedies of War or something oh, yeah. like that. He did one of those. He he, he I mean he had he had yeah. a lot of stuff that I think is yeah. actually right along the lines of this. Um, I mean, it wouldn't obviously be considered modern art, but uh, but it definitely had a political tone to them. You know, where he he dealt with history. Uh, events in history and, and put them out there for people to to be horrified by and I think that that something that Daumier you know wanted to continue with what was going to happen in France at that time sort of you know put it to to their time yes no I would agree with that that and and uh, the other interesting part of that is you know Goya being Spanish and this being French they definitely have their differences in how they look I mean, there's definitely a difference stylistically, but the but the number and succession, and then the also the obvious social and political commentary of both. There's right. definitely some parallels between them. So, so if someone loves this work, and you're out there not being an artsy fartsy guy, uh, Goya also has. But I would actually venture to say the Goya one is more graphic than this. This was, I think that this was more made for the masses, and maybe more. Um, not not a it wasn't as potent the the Goya ones some of them are hard to look at yeah well he definitely got gruesome again I think that's part of the that he wanted to horrify people yes he wanted to bring the reality of what you know what what war was to uh, to the people yeah where where Dumier was more comical in some ways 
but 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 uh, uh, a sharp tongue, if you will, more a little more on the political cleverness as far as that without the without the brute force attack of like a gruesome um, scene type thing. Right. You know. So, anyways, I just thought I'd pull that comparison because I think that it's it's relevant. You know. Well, and, and it will come up again, and 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 then, then, like I said, in in other contexts, it's there's there's not. Uh, much humor involved, and it is kind of gruesome. But we'll 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 get to that when we get to that. Yeah, right. So let let's go to the second one that I want us to talk about, which uh, is the um, Transnonian Street. Okay. Um, and okay. I know that you, I mean, uh, this one definitely, you know, harkens back to art school. And I'm bringing it up on screen here now. Why don't you talk to that a little bit? Well, and this is where I was going with the other one. Now, this is one that is there's no humor here at all, right? I mean, this right. is a this is a gruesome scene. There's there's really nothing funny about it. It's it's uh it's his depiction of an event where uh uh there was a raid on a on a residential building in the night. So these people are shown like in night clothing as though they were surprised and and killed with with like little, you know, very de- in, a, in a very defenseless uh, state, and I mean, if you look around, there's he he he, Domier obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, but more more than likely had never seen anything, but had heard about right. this event. So this is his take on it. This is his you know stage of the of the event that he. This is how he interpreted it and how he wanted people to see it. And, you know, it's one of those things where I believe he is trying to get people a little outraged, and yeah. and they were. In fact, I think some of the... the I think King Philip was, was more outraged than anybody that he would put this out there. He tried to tried to destroy all the copies of this because it's, a, it's, a, it's also a, a lithograph, so it's... You, know, you could print as many copies of it as you want once he etched the uh, the plate. Right. So he tried to destroy as many of these as he could, but they, he never could get them all. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a great point, though, is that that this is a a dramatization, and he never actually saw what it was. But I, I'd like to delve in a little bit on the fact that this is before photography. So so, and there is no, and I mean. Um, Another art reference for those out there is Ouija, who was a famous photographer in the what was in the fifties, who who would run forties and fifties, who would run around and take pictures. Uh, he had a police scanner, and he would show up on crime scenes from like the mob, and take photos of of the dead, you know, um, mob, you know, mobsters in the streets and stuff. Post and, hits. And it had the same, it was the same thing as this later, you know, right. but, but there was no photojournalist doing this kind of stuff. So this did have a shock value because people did not have access to see these things. Right, right. And, and I mean, he's positioned them in such a way that, you know, he wants, he wants it to be known that these people were sort of in a defenseless position in their night clothes next to their beds. But but the head is up in such a way that you can get become personal with it, where you see the face and you 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 know that could be, the whole point was that he was trying to put out that it could have been anybody, you know yes. these are people these are real people these are people just like you and me and uh, he wanted to attach a face to that and a face that you could actually you know. Oh yeah, well and, it, and it, that there, you could there, actually relate to. As you said before, there is there is as much as we say that there's you know he does satire. There is absolutely nothing funny about this scene. Right. And right. and the I'll tell you two things that strike me immediately is obviously the the position of the main figure of the man, the way his nightgown is is obviously you know a out of control. He is not. He is not posed that way. Yeah. The, the you know um, the, the nightgown is just revealing enough and to be uncomfortable. It'd be an uncomfortable thing for you to walk in on. The way that his legs are revealed, he's he's almost you know flashing himself type thing, but and obviously not comfortable. So he's obviously dead. You know. Yeah. The other thing that is that 
it is very uncomfortable in the scene is that he is full body weight on a child. Right. That's what I was just going to bring that up. I mean, if that's not outrageous enough, then you look and you see he's he's on top of yeah. a, a small yeah. child. Yeah. And that, which, that you know, it tells its own story. It's a very dramatic scene. And and I could when you say the king is trying to destroy every copy of these, that is why. <laughs> There, there is there is no good part of this. You know what I mean? Right. So uh, yeah. So so this would definitely be um, a, a great example. And and of course this is one of the the high examples uh, of the social and political attacks. This is why his work. When people say that he was a political artist and they attacked the the king's you know uh, regime, this is what we're talking about. This is a. Uh, a shocking image for the general public to see and also an offensive image to the king and the way he's ruling the, the regions you know um, this is what people mean by that when they say this was shock art at the time yeah yeah so, no doubt about it so let's uh let's move on from that i mean i i know that's a that that one piece we could probably talk about for quite a while but uh um dumier had so many good pieces Let, let's move on to the legislative belly and this is definitely, um, it's not as harsh as, as the last one, but, um, but it's definitely a critique on the, on the bureaucracy. Oh, yeah, this one's great. And, and uh, I, I get a lot out of this one. Um, it, this, this, I think, speaks to generations of artists moving forward. Because I see, I see bellows in this. Uh, which is a famous painter for those who aren't following. Uh, Francis Bacon, I see in this. Yeah, yeah. I see, you know, people that do obviously caricatures from here on, from here to infinity. Um, this is, I don't want to say this is the first of these, but this is a great example of what he would do as a political satire. Um, it, I mean, and and think about the level of work that this would involve. This is not just a group of two or three heads, or the, this is this is beyond even what the Dutch sittings would have of of like militias. This mm -hmm. is more people, I would say, than in one of those Dutch paintings of the militias, which we always sit there and go, "Oh my God, so much work would go into this." And uh, now, granted, this is not oil paint; it's 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 a uh, you know um, a print. But, but still, the level of, of effort that goes into this many caricaturized portraits is pretty amazing. I just like, I just like the, I mean, you, you hear so much about, you know, fat cats in politics, and I just, yeah. I, I, I chuckle at it. I think it's very funny that he's, that he's uh, you know, sort of played that up a bunch. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> This this uh, this has a lot of uh, interesting dynamics to it as a piece too because you're right the, the caricatures themselves you can literally just entertain yourself all day looking at these, mm -hmm. uh, but also from a from a structural standpoint as an image, it kind of breaks a lot of rules at the time. It, it's not it's not a traditional scene that that a person at this time would be making images in this way. Does that make sense? Right, right. It, it, and I think he was taking the liberty of it being both caricature and also being a print and not an oil painting, let's say. And, and he was taking that liberty of, you know what, since I'm not tied to those things, I'm going to take some other rules and, and, and bend them around. He's not breaking any rules, but it'd be very weird to see literally bands of heads in rows as your image. That would not be a normal setting that you would... Uh, that you would promote as what you would do as a high art, you know. It's a, it's an interesting piece uh, uh, that that speaks in a lot of different levels. I think. Yeah, and, and mainly, I mean, I, I just you cannot deny the humor, you know. That's a <laughs> it's that's a big part of this. Oh yeah, I, I can only imagine people of the time looking at this and probably being able to identify actual like politicians or. <laughs> Or, True. Or, you know, True. Can you imagine if we like you saw something like this with the the U.S. Senate or something? You know, done done exactly like this, and you could you could see their faces, and you could you could start to pick out who was who. Yeah, I think that would be pretty funny. 
Oh yeah, definitely. So so just another. I, I really threw that in there as another good example of his printmaking. But we've got to talk about. Uh, well, I'm sorry. One more print, and I'm really bringing this up for more historical value than anything else, which is the print of um, Nadar. Or how do you say it? Nadar. Nadar. Um, I don't know. Nadar. I'm not sure. Nadar. I, I, I refuse to say Nader because I'm assume I think of Nader like here in the States, you know, yeah. <laughs> the politician. But um, but uh, I no, only bring this up that? because say again. That I only bring this up because it shows the the interest in photography as a as a new thing and a exciting place for artists and stuff like that. Is that you know it's to the point where where um, Nader is is getting you know um, fame for becoming a photographer and turning this thing that is a science experiment and in image making and stuff into an art form and and is starting to push the boundaries and it's basically a painter who's a, and, and again he's. He, this is where Dumier is kind of interesting because he's not such a traditional painter that he's not making prints and publishing and doing other things. So he's not, he doesn't have that nose up to this new idea of photography. And he sees it as just a new exciting thing to do. And being a printmaker, he, he's not totally turned off by this idea of things other than just painting and stuff. And uh, I, I just find this as a quick side note interesting thing is that Dumier did make pieces that kind of acknowledge some of these new technologies and new ideas. And of course they were going into publication so it would have fascinated people by the, by the new technology that was happening. Um, and, and again, I, I brought it up less as an art piece to talk about but more as a reference of the time. Well, and it's also, this is also, you know, 1862 as opposed to uh, you know, the 1834, right. where, where we've been talking about, you know, 1832 and 1834 are the previous two pieces we were talking about. So this is, this is you know, 30 years past that point, and, point. and you're right, technology is, is radically changing for them at this point. And that's a good point to be made also, is that is that he was doing works like this not just for one period of his life, he was doing it for, for many, many, many years. Um, so, so anyways, let's, let's move on to a painting. And, and, you know, people are probably wondering, did the guy do any paintings? Because <laughs> we've talked about nothing but prints, right? So let's bring up, uh, now, I don't know about you, Dennis, because we weren't in the same classes, but I know that when they talked about Dumier with painting, this was really the, the one that came up and had the long lecture, which is the wagon of the third, cl of the third class. Right. And uh, this is a, a um, groundbreaking, if you will, Dumier piece. This is the piece that people, that I am aware of, of people pointing to as one of the great Dumier paintings. Um, and it has bits of all of his elements as well as a good representation of how he used form and shape and light and all those things. Um, do you want to talk to that a little bit? Um. Sure. I mean, you can you can still see uh, the the they're not caricatures again, but you can see his sort of stylistic uh, his draw his draftsmanship appearing in this painting. Yep. But more important to me is uh, just the social comment of it all. You know, we we talked about you know uh, the lower classes and whatnot in in, in Mie's work. Mie made it beautiful. And, and wanted you to see that the beautiful wor you know world of the farmer of the poor farmer whatever um, but but here Damier is not interested in beauty so much as the as the reality of it you know it, it, up until this point as we've talked with other uh, artists painting was about things all things grand you know and here we have a, a group of people who couldn't afford anything more than to get into this third class carriage um, to take a trip somewhere, and it's it's uh, it's really it's really a, a social comment, you know, as much as anything. I mean, it's a beautiful painting, but it's showing a side of the social structure that is kind of ugly, you know. That 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 some people have to go in the in the 
go with the least amenities, whereas others have a lot of them, you know, and, and, and he's kind of pointing, he's, he's making a, uh, making people aware of, of how, how bizarre it is, I guess, yeah. that, you know, some people live so comfortably and some people live so uncomfortably. Uh, and that was a big deal at, at that time, because like I said, this is the time when finally the lower classes were starting to have a voice. And yep. so he's 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 helping him along. I I uh, I like the point you're making about that, that that he is he's talking about the ugliness. He's talking about and and these are not ugly people. That's not what I mean by that. No, but, me me either. Me either. I, we, we we're talking about just the ugliness of the class system and and, and all that. Yeah, and and I think there are things in this that uh, that speak to that that maybe our generation of people don't even don't even latch on to. You know the the uh, the crowdedness of this of this um, train car that they're in. Well, they're on like a bench seat, right? That's a hardwood bench instead yeah. of you know. Yeah. A seat well, that the, would have, that would be an individual seat. Uh, I mean, it, it would be great if you could see the other cars of this of this thing. You know, whether it be a train or what. Uh, to see how how the other classes are the other you know what what about second class or first class what kind of comforts do they have that this doesn't right. have because this looks like it could be the freight carriage right it could yep. be freight in here but they've they've jammed in a bunch of people instead. Well, also his his directness of application makes people look and and some of this is kind of like the. Uh, goes back to paintings from like the Renaissance, but his application of the paint makes them feel like earthy and dirty and 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 grimy and sweaty and you know what I mean. Like the, there is no there's no photoshopping of this thing. There's no <laughs> right. you know, these are not glamour shots of these guys, right? And, and and in fairness, a lot of your portrait painters, a lot of your scene painters. You're getting the get my best side kind of portraiture. You're getting the you know remove the mole and make sure that I look rosy cheeks and things like. And this is none of that. Right. This is this is mom in her sweats shopping at Walmart with two kids latched on. Right. No, but I mean <laughs> right. This is this is that scene and at the time totally not what you put in a painting. Right. And and I agree with what you said, which I didn't think of it that way until you said it. But it makes perfect sense is that even the other guys we talked about, like Corbet is a good example. Corbet was still, even though he was showing that class of people, he was still demonstrating them into the painting aura. You know what I mean? He was still, um, he was showing them grimy, but they were they were theatrically grimy. They were They were like the big screen dirty hero. Where this is like an actual picture of a dirty hero, <laughs> you know what right, I mean? Right. Like, like the, an actual snapshot, no preparation. Well, and, this is and like that's you a know, great I, point. I, this is what their definition of realism, you know, comes from. Right. It, the, the Corbet realism is about about not just showing us the world in in, in the way it really looks, but it's it's showing. The world how it really is you know what i mean how, how the reality of of classes the reality of 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 the way it is right well and and is it fair to say that this is where the the caricature aura you know the the if someone who is a high artist right and and what i mean by that is someone who's classically trained and blah 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 and they're looking at caricature, and they're going, "Well, it's it's a representation of people, but it's it's over dramatized, and and it's it's below me." This is where someone who has, as you mentioned earlier, 30, 40 years of of character caricature understanding, is now like leveraging that understanding to get a better, more direct feeling for how to convey these people does that make sense totally if, makes sense if he You're was right. if he spent a career of glossing people up he would have a hard time getting the real look that this has right so when 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 you say that this is an overly caricature that these people are represented more real but he would never get the effect he was looking for the directness of the paint and all that without his knowledge of caricature is that a fair way to say it? You think? Yeah, I, I totally do. And on another side note too, I think you know he's one of the first 
artists to uh, to of the modern of the modern era to to use historic use the history or the the the, the events of history in this way, yes. you know, for this purpose. Yep. No, I agree. I agree. So, um, so good. Well, we're right on time here, Dennis. Um, let's, uh, to sum up, he, uh, he didn't have a, uh, he was not famous, let's say for his work until towards the end, it seems like to me, um, he struggled most of his life with, you know, he'd be popular, but in circles. Right. He probably had, he, he had a job, you know? Yeah. So people knew of him, but they didn't look at him. He probably had a tough time breaking through and getting the respect of, of the, the fine art world. But I, I, I'm just, I guess I'm saying that more from a guessing point than, than, than an actual well, knowledge standpoint well, or I factual that, standpoint. But I would assume that would be tough for somebody like that. Yeah. Well, towards the end, I know that he had the respect of, like we said last week, uh, Corot and those guys were helping him along. Um, because obviously he had financial troubles throughout and his only real respectable solo, you know, exhibition of his work was at the very end of his life. Um, and, and he, at least he got to enjoy that, but, but I mean, you know, he, he did not get that until it was, it was very, very hard earned until the very end. So again, very different from like a Corot or, or, or even a Corbet who, who at least had the momentum on his side to, to. Uh, exude his fame you know what i mean so yeah. that is that is dumier a uh, great painter uh, definitely an influence on me um and, and i know dennis uh, just in us talking uh, in other circles uh, that i know you like him also yeah. um and uh from from his seeds uh again the directness of impressionism we're going to keep saying impressionism because the next couple of guys all very much influence impressionism but, uh, you know, the, not so much uh, color sense for him, because I think he still comes from a very Dutch kind of background for the color sense. But, yeah. um, but the, the directness of approach from Dumier is, is a big hit with Impressionists. And then, and then also, you know, it's very unique that a guy is famous, um, whether it's, you know, in his case, probably more famous even after his life, for his defiance of political interests and that becoming a a staple of what he's famous for is is a very interesting thing that we will see revisited in the years to come with with other artists um and again not that he was the first but i think he's one of the first in this kind of this style of painting any closing uh closing shots on dumier before we wrap this puppy up um, I think we've covered a lot. I, I, I would only say that I, I also think, and we've, I mentioned this in the other, in the last podcast, was that I do. I, you have to credit him with with a lot of the political cartoons, uh, comics, and things that have gone on all the way up to the present time. Yeah. I mean, he, he's there's no way you can look at any of that thing, uh, any of that stuff, and not see that he he started something. You know that he could not have known. Uh, how much or how you know how widespread it could go i i definitely agree and, and and again i don't know that he was the first caricature artist but he was but he was definitely the first one that's a high art equivalency you know what i mean that that influenced people all over but there's that bridge between commercial art and fine art and, and it's nice cool. to see that you know yeah and and you know when we get into um, the post-impressionists and, and the Americans, when we get into all that stuff, you're going to see a lot of influence come from commercial work. I mean, the, there's there's a lot of uh, things where you go, well, geez, how did they think to do this? And then once they did the research, you find out that it was the wrapping paper of the dishes or the, you know what I mean? Th things that influenced these painters that were not from a museum. There were things that were done cheaply commercially, and they right. started incorporating them more and more and more into fine art. Right. So, uh, so you're yeah. talking about you're re referring to the Japanese prints that they would put on the wrapping paper that that, that they would send when they shipped things from yeah. Asia to France. Yep. Yeah. And how that would that influence was a big like deal. the Van Goghs. They were very guys. influenced by that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, well, what a, what an interesting art like spin. You know what I mean? It, it suddenly suddenly makes you feel better when you say, "Hey, I learned to draw from comic books." You know what I mean? <laughs> right. <So. laughs> 
<laughs> you can okay. learn from anything, and yeah. you can be influenced by anything. Yeah, it makes me feel better, right? <laughs> At least. <laughs> So, uh, okay, well, that's great. That is Dumier, and this is another one in the can. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you. And uh, we will be back. Um, thanks for watching uh, The Modern Art Family Tree. We will see you next time.